Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Crosswalk Church. I'm Pastor Armand Agnew. Good morning, church. How's everybody today in the house? Got a house full of people and technicians. We're cruising right along today. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to welcome everybody uh, watching us live this morning by Facebook, uh, YouTube, and Twitch. You may be watching us later on in the week. Welcome today to our service. We had a good time of worship this morning. God really moved and we're thankful. How, how many of y'all know that when we get together, God shows up? <clears throat> Let me get something hot from my throat here this morning. I'm struggling with a little bit of the change in the air. Ah, that's good. All right, so today we're doing Pentecost Part 2. <clears throat> As we go in the next couple of weeks, we're going to really be dealing with, uh, with Pentecost and the baptism of the Holy Spirit so we may not be broadcasting everything because right now we have a little set that we're working off of. And, and to do what I want to do, we may not be able to do that. But for today, we're going to look at Pentecost. But this is what we're going to look at. Famous last words. Some of these y'all have heard. Some of them are funny. Some of them are not so funny. But let me just give these to you today. A redneck's famous last words. Hold my beer and watch this. Right before they die. Do what? Hold the flashlight. I don't know about the hold the flashlight one. <clears throat> now, this one I didn't know. But, but Elvis, look what it says. Elvis said this. I'm going to the bathroom to read. He said that. Now, he said it in, in private. But what happened was he went to the bathroom and he, he OD'd. He died on the toilet. That's, yeah, that's the truth. That's the truth. Frank, Frank Sinatra said... I'm losing it. This was his last words. Sarah, could you check that? It's kind of the focus isn't right. I don't know if it's locked. Unlock that focus for me if it is. Thank you. We're going to get all this. Oh, I didn't know that was going to come up. But anyway, she's getting that. Now, this one. Okay, but what happens if I go here? Hey, all right. I hate it when it's not focused. I was looking. I'm going, man, I don't have good eyesight anyway. Look at this one, though. This one is kind of funny. And this is what it said. This is John Sedgwick. He was a general of the uh, Union Army, and he was shot saying this, Tyler, in mid-sentence. He goes, they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. And he got hit. <clears throat> and he died. How many of y'all know that? That's kind of comical, but kind of sad. At the same. You're a sick pastor. You're a real sick pastor, man. That, that is something else. Let me give you a couple more here. And these are actual. There we go. Leonardo da Vinci said, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. He was a perfectionist. <clears throat> it just wasn't working for him. We'll try that again. There we go. It works. <clears throat> W.C. Fields. How many of y'all remember him? He uses God's name in vain. He says his last words, y'all. He says, the whole freaking world and everyone in it but you, Charlotta, his mistress. So he cursed God as he was dying. Well, guess what happens to him? Yeah. Now, I like Pete Maravich. How many of y'all remember Pete Maravich? What was his nickname? Harrison's got Pistol Pete. All my Louisiana friends. He played for LSU and the New Orleans Jazz. So great player incredible player, but this is what he said. He says, as he was dying, remember he, he was like 40 some odd years old. He was doing a pickup game uh, on the basketball court and falls over. And as he's dying on the basketball court, he goes, I feel great. Well, this is why he was a Christian. Before that, he said this. He said, I want to be remembered as a Christian, a person that serves him, Jesus, to the utmost, not as a basketball player. Wow. Famous last words. We all have read them. They're, these are just some. There's so many out there. But what would your famous last words be? Does anybody know? Have you thought about that? Now, we don't want to think about that. That's too, too uh, fatalistic, we can speak. But here's the thing we need to understand. Luke records some of Jesus' words, and these are the last words, and they contain God's plan for the church. Let me show you what these are today. These, by the way, if you have your Bibles today, turn to Luke 24, 45 through 49. These are the last words that Luke records, 
and he records three very, very important things that we need to understand today. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. <clears throat> and this is a three-part thing of what were Jesus' last three things that he told the church. How many of y'all want to know? Yeah, hey, listen. If Jesus' last three things he said were said, they were important things. Because Jesus didn't mince or waste his words. So what in the world could they be? Well, let's turn to Luke and we'll see. Let's look at uh, the first one in 45 and 46. This is what he said. He says, Jesus had to die and resurrect. By his own words, look at what it says, 45 through 46. Then opened he their understanding. Everybody say understanding. I'm going to break that down for you a little bit here in a minute. That they might understand. Everybody say understand. These are two key words that we miss. And we miss it because we don't really know what the Messiah was saying. I'll break that down. It says, understand the scriptures. And said unto them, thus it is written. And thus it is uh, behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. So what is he saying here? What's going on? Well, this is what he's saying. Let me, when you understand the Greek on the understand, <laughs> we're going to understand the word understand. It makes things more clear. Now, for some people, this is going to be great. You're going to be shouting. For some of y'all, you're going to get offended because the word of God is going to offend. This is not my opinion. These are Jesus's last words. Can I get an amen in the house today? Can I get an amen at home? understanding the scripture there are two times he used the word understanding and understand they're different words so what are they well the first one understanding is the word the greek word noose and it means this intellect or mind have an open mind so when you read that he says then opened he their mind so that they would understand in other words it went through the ear gate into the mind gate so they could process what he was saying, the mind gate today, when we're witnessing, we tell people that Jesus died for their sin. He, Jesus said he suffered and died and rose again for his sin. Now, there's a difference between just dying and suffering. Some people die instantaneous. Some people suffer. Jesus chose to suffer and die, but resurrect. This goes through the ear gate to the mind. So the mind needs to grasp the fact that Jesus died for you. His last words were this. I gave my life. I suffered and died for you, but I resurrected. This has got to get into the mind first. That's why we witness to people. So when we talk to them, what's the first thing they do? They hear what we say. Now, here's the difference. A lot of people hear it. But they don't understand the second part of this. He says this, that they might understand. So it comes in through the, the mind, but it's got to drop to the heart. This is what it says. Understand the second word is the word sunimi. It means to put together, to comprehend. You got to get it from the mind to the heart. Because there's a lot of people that have a mind image of God. They understand in their mind who Jesus was. They understand in their mind, in their head logic, that he died and he rose again. But it never got into their heart. Until it gets into your heart, you're never going to change or allow God to change your life. You're just going to add God to your life. It's head knowledge. Romans 10 says, if you confess, coming out of the head, with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord. But he doesn't stop there. He says, and what? Believe in the what? In the heart, drop it down from the head to the heart. This is the first of Jesus' last words. Get it from your head to your heart. Listen, today, many pastors in many churches are getting it to people's heads. They talk about it. But nobody's changing their lifestyle, which means this. It's not getting to the heart. Because when it gets to the heart, when you get to the heart of the matter, your life will change. Well, there's people filling churches all over the planet today. It's just head knowledge. It hasn't gotten 
to their heart yet. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that it was written. Now, what Jesus is talking about? It was already written about his death. It was already written about his resurrection. So where is that? What in the world is he talking about? Well, let me give it to you today. Let me go to Isaiah. Now, look at Isaiah. Let's get the word today. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. This is the suffering Messiah. This was written by Isaiah oh, somewhere around 700 years before Jesus was ever born. It's found uh, in uh, 52 and 53. It's called the suffering Messiah passages. When you read these, if it doesn't move your heart, it's still in your head. It hasn't gotten into your heart. If you watched Mel Gibson's the movie The Passion and you didn't cry, it didn't get to your heart. It's still in your head. Because you can't sit through that movie and watch what that man endured for us. This is what he's saying in Isaiah. It pleased the Lord. It pleased God to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sins, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. This is what he's saying. For God so loved the world that he sent himself, his only begotten son, to suffer, not just die, but to suffer, be mocked, to suffer a cruel Crucifixion is the cruelest way that you can die. It's agonizing. It's long. It's painful. And a lot of people will think, well, you know, Jesus was God. He just offset the pain. No, he bled real blood. He suffered real pain. And when we do our encounter weekends, we go through the medical uh, accounts of what happens when nails are driven through your flesh and they hit those nerves. What happens to your body? What happens to you when they beat a crown of thorns upon your head? I'm not going to get into that today. But listen, it's very violent. But he did it for us. This is what Jesus said when my father said, it is written. It is written. Let me give you another part of this. It says this. This was written by David when he was escaping Saul in about 979 B.C. He said this. He says in Psalm 16, verse 10. For thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. What does that mean? It means David was prophesying about Jesus was going to resurrect. Hell was not going to keep our Lord and Savior. Jesus went to hell, but not to suffer. Jesus never suffered. He went to hell to kick down some gates. Come on, he had the keys in his hand. He didn't take the keys from the devil. He already had the keys. He already had the authority. He just went and kicked the gates down and put him in his place. Come on, y'all need to understand that. He went to hell to say, devil, I gave my life. I'm coming here so that when I resurrect, you lose. And everyone that follows me, you lose in their lives because death and hell will not hold the believer. Woo, come on, church. This is what it's about. Come on, Miss Millie, I can see it. You're getting in it. Listen, we need to understand the scriptures in our hearts that Jesus' last words were, I died for you, I resurrected for you, so that you could have not just life, but that you could have an abundant life in this world. Listen, you should have the authority to just preach this on the mantle with stranger things. You need to go and watch it. God has given us the mantle of power and authority by the Holy Spirit. He has cloaked us, endued us with the power that we have the same authority now that Jesus had over the enemy because he gave it to us. Come on, church. Woo! I might just get happy up in here. Oh, okay. It's getting high. He was going. He was pulling. I thought the microphone had felt or something happened there. All right, let me go on. I got my tech crew here. They're, they're keeping me going. Two thumbs up. Here's the second one he said Essentials of true salvation. Everybody say true salvation. 
We're talking about what Jesus said. We're not talking about what the church has become. We're not talking about what man has made, what God created. We're not going to talk about how man got his hands involved in the things of God. Listen, when man gets, gets his hands involved in the things of God, he can mess it up. When you get your hands into God's plans for your life and you start trying to work it in your own, you're going to mess it up. Can I get a witness? How many of y'all are, are front row seaters on that? You know what I'm talking about? He don't need no thank you. He doesn't need your help. What he needs to do is to trust him. Come on, somebody say amen. Look at this verse, 47 and 48. It says this, And that repentance, say repentance. It's the essential of true salvation. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. So what he's saying is, if you're going to have your sins removed, the remission of sins, repentance must come first. Can I get an amen in the house today? You got to listen. We, we've missed this. We've missed this. Let me just show you this today. We don't know what repentance is. Repentance is this. It's remorse. It's regret and conviction of previous actions. It's a complete 180 turn. Not 360. 360 puts you back in the other same direction. It's a 180 turn. It means that once I did this, I no longer do that because I am serving God. Look at Matthew 3, 8 says this. Bring forth, therefore, fruits. Everybody say fruits. Fruits meet for repentance. What's he saying there? He's saying those of you that are saved and you have repented of your sin. Let me see the fruits of God. Let me see the fruit of the Spirit. Let me see the fruits of righteousness that you begin to produce. You will be known by your fruits. If you're walking around all the time and you're an angry, angry person, listen, that's a problem. I really have a problem. I'm going to step on some toes today. I want you to get this today. I see people I know that are not serving God. I know that their actions don't meet with repentance. And here they are. And I know what they've done. I've seen what they've done. And here I see them on Facebook posting all these pictures with scriptures and all these things about how great God is. Listen, you cannot serve God and worship God with a mouth that's spewing poison and venom all week. I told y'all it was going to hurt today. It going to hurt. You need to bring forth fruits. What are they? Well, the fruits of the Spirit, everybody knows those fruits. Love, joy, peace. You know, I could go on and on. Listen, those are the fruits. Go back and read those. Those are the fruits that we should be producing. Oh, but you don't know what my life's like. You don't know what's going on. You don't know the problems I've been through. <laughs> yeah, I do. I know someone that knows even more. That's God. God knows. Jesus went through more than you can ever imagine. In fact, when he was being nailed on the cross, the very thing that's attacking you came upon him. He nailed it to the cross. Can I get an amen in the house today? Amen. Listen, even the devil can hang out in the church. Do what? Let me give you an example. Now, Paul is in Philippi of Macedonia, and he's at the Riverside Church. I'm not talking about the big building on the lake. I'm talking about the river. <laughs> I'm talking about where the believers gathered together by the river and had church. But this is what was happening as they were coming back every day. Now watch this. Follow with me today. You got to see this. Look at this. And it says, in Acts 16, 16 through 18. And it came to pass as we went to prayer. Now this is the we section of Acts that Luke wrote. He's got, now it changes to Luke's talking about we or whatever. It goes on. And we went to prayer. A certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us. She was full of the devil. She was possessed of the devil. She could tell people's future. I'm going to tell you the whole story. It says this. And met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Now, whether it was real or not, she was still bringing them money. 
The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Look at what the devil said. These men are of God. They are showing us the way of salvation. The demon was saying this. How do we know? Well, look at what it says. And this she did many days. Paul just let it go for a while. But then he gets, he gets tired of it. He really begins to go, wait a minute, you're counterproductive here. And it says, and this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit. In other words, he knew it was the devil saying it. The devil don't give God praise. It was blasphemous. It was trying to bring down their credibility. If the people knew that they were associated with her, who wasn't living for God, and lived for the devil, talked about the devil, now that she's trying to attach herself to that, Paul goes, wait a second, you don't belong with us. And this is what he goes. He turns and says to the Spirit, I command, he says to the Spirit, not the girl. He says to the devil, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that same hour. She got saved. That caused a lot of problems later. But listen, the devil can come to church. The devil will know who's God, who God is. And he will try to water down the real deal. Listen, just because you go to church doesn't mean that you've repented from your sins. You can attend church today and you can be doing all the motions you want to do and have people believe in who you think they want you, you know, who you want them to think you are, but you're not saved. You have not repented for your lifestyle. Listen, it used to be that people in church would hide their sins. Now they're open about it, going, well, God loves me. Surely God wouldn't send me to hell. I still go to church. Well, you haven't repented of that sin. You're not bringing forth fruits of your repentance. So let me go on. Let me just tell you something today. The church is not a social club. It's not where you go just to hang out with people because you're lonely or you go because there's great programs. or what. The church is not about that. Listen, the church is not a babysitting service. We would have ch people bring uh, their children to our nursery during church time, drop them off, and go to lunch. That's not what the church is about. Listen, it's not a concert hall for entertainment. It's not to go watch some great band or orchestra with this good-looking worship leader that can sing like an angel up there dancing around, and you're going, oh, man, I wish I could sing like that. This is so great. Oh, I wish I could play the bass like that. Oh, this is so entertaining to me. It's not about that. Come on, can I get a witness today? This is what the church is becoming. Listen, church is not a speed dating service. You know what, if we'd go, and I'm not knocking any church, because there's big churches that love Jesus, man. They're there for the right reason. But there's a lot of people, and I know them, I know people that go to big churches because they're, they're shopping for the next Mr. or Mrs. And they come to counseling to the pastors, and the pastors go, you know, y'all need to wait a little bit. And, oh, no, we're in love. And they get married. Next thing you know, they're not in church anymore. Oh, here's another thing. Just because you're both Christians doesn't mean you're right for each other. That is not one of the checklists on your box. It needs to be one of them, but it doesn't need to be the main one. Well, they're a Christian. Check. Oh, they're the right one. Because you may not be compatible with that person. You need counseling. You need godly guidance from the elders in the church from wise women in the church. That's why the New Testament, come on, can I go here? That's why the New Testament talks about the mature women to teach the young women. And it's usually about marriage. How do you uh, keep the home? How do you love your husband? And the same thing. Listen, we need to get back to Bible basics today and understand what our roles are as believers in the church, as men in the church, as women in the church, and as children in the church. That's what he's saying here. It's about repentance. It's about coming in all messed up. 
Your life is just a disaster. You've made it so messed up or somebody in a situation or a person has messed you up so much. Church needs to be the place where you can go. It needs to be the oasis in the desert. It needs to be that strong tower in your life that you can run to where God can meet you face to face and begin to dust you off today, to begin to clean you up today, to begin to put the mantle of the Holy Spirit on your life so that you can walk above, so that you can become the head and not the tail any longer. Ugh. I wasn't tied to this rope right now. Y'all I'll be uh, running around the, run around my little podium right here. I've got a 10 foot by 10 foot area I can move around in. Woo! Somebody say amen. amen. It's where repented people come to worship God, the God of mercy and the God of grace. To worship Him with everything we have. To worship Him with every, did y'all get this today? Every, that's what church is for. It's for us to learn more about God, to teach another generation that it's about repentance. We need to repent and turn and have God's Spirit change our direction. Until we do that, all we are is just a dirty sinner sitting in a holy place. Nothing's changed. Third one. This one I call Lanyap. Spirit. Oh, I didn't change it. Okay, hold on just a second. One second. I think I'm still on my other point. I am. Let me back up a step. <laughs> I got to preaching and I lost my mind. Is that okay? <laughs> you know, I, I don't follow notes well. And what is it? Salvation <laughs> comes by the Holy Spirit. Look at this. In John 16, 8. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. In other words, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, He goes across the planet and He, he reproves people of sin. Now, we, we've done a lot of different things. We've done the way of the master. We've done evangelism explosion. We've done all these, uh, you know, witnessing programs. And they all teach you the same thing. You need to go. And someone needs to be praying in the Spirit when you, when you go to minister to somebody. You need to be in pairs. Listen, I've done a lot of street work. I understand. There's a time to speak and a time not to speak. There's a time I've walked up to people all ready to, to talk to them about God, and I knew that they weren't ready for it. Then there's a time I knew they were ready. And man, we got on them. We jumped on them with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing. If the Holy Spirit is not moving in this situation, nothing's going to happen. It's the Holy Spirit that draws. Look what it says. And when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness, and of judgment. So any church service that doesn't have the Holy Spirit moving, people are not going to be convicted. There's a pastor uh, acquaintance. I don't, I'm not like his buddy, but I do know of him. He has a big, big church in, in Columbia. And uh, do we need to go ahead and make the switch? Go ahead. He has a big church in Columbia, and he came uh, to the States, and he went to one of the biggest churches in, in, in North America, and he got there, and he, he was like, man, at the, at the end of the service, he says, you know what, man, they, they were polished. The building looks good. They had all the literature right. They had, you know, all the right people making announcements and the right singers, and the, the announcements were like something Hollywood would produce. It was all amazing, except for one thing. The Holy Spirit wasn't in that church. It was all about entertainment and show, and the Holy Spirit wasn't there. Let me tell you something. If the Holy Spirit is not there, then it's going to be hard for people to be convicted. So pastors, you need to start preaching under the anointing and the unction of the Holy Spirit so people will repent. Not just join your church because they're a doctor and they can tithe big. Who cares about all that? What it is, we're trying to fill seats in heaven, not seats in the church. Just saying. Now, let me go on. <laughs> I, was, I jumped down to number three. Here we go. The third one is this. Spiritual lanyap. Now, this is for all of my Louisiana friends. Everybody in Louisiana knows what lanyap is. It's a little extra, and it doesn't cost you nothing. So here's the little extra tonight, today. Number three. The first one was he, he spoke about his death and resurrection. He spoke, number two, about 
real salvation. Number three, he's speaking about a little extra, something more. Look at verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. There's that word again. Endued means that you fall into the cloak of the Holy Spirit, that it just wraps around you. The land yap is this. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tread where a lot of people, you know, I've, I've got a lot of friends, different denominations, different people believe different things, but I just have to believe what I think the Word says. And so I'm going to jump on it right here this way. It says this. It says, I send the promise of my Father. What's he talking about? Well, it's something that had to be spoken before Jesus was born. And Joel is one. Joel 2, 28, 29. Man, I get all kinds of goosebumps thinking about this verse here. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. The Holy Spirit was poured out 2,000 years ago in an upper room. I've been there. Bill and Sandra have been there. We can take you right to the place where the Holy Spirit actually fell out. I'm telling you something. It is a powerful place to stand in Jerusalem. You're standing right where the church was born. And listen, it didn't stop then. It says it goes on that the Holy Spirit and power will be poured out from that day till Jesus comes back. It's going to be poured out. And it says that things are going to happen, that uh, it's going to your sons and your daughters will prophesy your uh, your men, your older men and your young men are going to dream dreams. Listen, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, it was poured out on all flesh, not just some flesh, all flesh. And this is a different work than salvation. Salvation spirit gets us saved. It's a robe of salvation. But it, there's more. According to the Word of God, I believe there's something more, and that is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Let me give it to you in Isaiah. Woo, come on. If you're with me today in the church, say amen. amen. Good stuff. Isaiah 44, 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit unto thy seed and my blessings upon thine offspring. Saying in the future, he's talking Years before Jesus was born, before the Holy Spirit was poured out, I'm going to pour my spirit out on the church. It is another work of the Holy Spirit for believers. Listen, we're going to be endued with power. We're going to be clothed in power. It is a stranger thing, jumping back to my my Bible study series about the mantle. You need to understand now, I understand there's some great men that have done great things that said they, they weren't speaking in tongues, but they didn't deny that it was possible. But I'm going to tell you something right now. I believe that the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the evidence of speaking in tongues is especially for today. If you don't believe me, look around and see what these people are doing to our world and to our country. You better have the Holy Spirit in this day and age. Somebody say amen. Come on, you better have the Holy Spirit just to go to Walmart today. You need a double portion of God's Spirit when you go to pump your gas and you can't believe that the price of gas is going where it is. You got to go, Holy Spirit, you're my provider. I'm going to believe and I'm going to believe. Listen, you need to have that power that God wants to put upon you that increases your relationship with the Lord. It's that power that comes upon you when you're in that stressful time, that time where you can compromise. It, the Holy Spirit can come upon you and guide you to the time, to the place where there's holiness in your life. You begin to see the things that you used to fall for, but now the Holy Spirit says, listen, you walk for God now. You're going to produce fruit for God now. You don't need those things because those things will never satisfy. They will never fill you. And at the end of the day, they will leave you home. Hopeless and helpless. But I'm going to give you the power of God's Holy Spirit that will never leave you nor forsake you. It will empower you to have that relationship with God that nothing, nothing, nothing in this world can take from you. Because greater is He 
that is in you, that is he, that is in the world. It will give you the power to be the witness for the Lord. Listen, when you're full of God's Holy Spirit and anointings upon you, you're not going to be at a lack of words to talk to people. You're not going to be afraid to talk to people because the Spirit is going before you. And you will be able to say things that you won't even know or remember that you said before. Come on, somebody say amen. When you have the power of the Holy Spirit, your prayers become powerful. They're not just, now I lay thee down to sleep where God bless this soup. It's words that move mountains. It's words of power that reaches across continents and touches missionaries. And it touches the lost. It touches the Muslims. It touches all those in the world that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, it can begin to change the attitude in America. It can begin to save those that were about to become mass murderers now become Christians for God. Listen, we don't need to take the guns out of school. We don't need to regulate that. What we need to, maybe a little bit, but what we need is a moving of God's Holy Spirit on our country today. I don't, I believe in the Second Amendment. I think we should have the right to carry guns. I think it should be hard for people to get them. But to, to keep guns out is not the problem. We can see that. I don't want to get political today, but we need to be praying about that. We need to pray today that God overturns Roe versus Wade. And the ungodly thing that's been around, it has murdered millions and millions of, our, of people. Listen, we need to be praying that God's Spirit moves against that. We need to be praying that God's Spirit moves against this administration of buffoons that are anti-God and anti-Christian. That God will move and do something. Somebody say amen. It's the power that transforms our words and our deeds. One little cup of water with the power of the Holy Spirit can change a lot of things. Come on. Power to be vessels for God's Spirit to move in. You got to have the baptism, the overflowing, the fullness of God's Spirit to be able to operate like we need to be operating. And listen, I'm going to be honest with you. The church has dropped the ball here. We need to get back. And I'll tell you why. Because we're, we're more concerned about people paying their tithes than we are about the power of God's Holy Spirit moving in our services. We don't want to offend people. We don't want to talk about speaking in tongues and seeing a manifestation of God because it may offend the rich and they would leave. We got to get past that, church. Come on. We got to get past that. I'm going to close with this verse here. Colossians. Come on. This is powerful preaching this morning. We got to get this. Colossians 1, 10 to 11. That ye may walk. Everybody say walk. walk. This is a Christian walk. This is discipleship. This is a walk of repentance. That you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Check yourself. Are you what you're doing? What you're saying, is it pleasing to God? I'm talking about Monday through Sunday. I'm talking seven days a week here. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthening with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Every day with Jesus is better than the day... Wait, is that a song? Are y'all going to break out? In, I got to be careful. My people like to sing. Be breaking out in song here. Listen, it's all about Pentecost. Pentecost was the birth a church that had power, power in word and deed to change an ungodly world around them. That's the power that God gave us so that you could change the world around you. If you walk around and you wear the title believer and Christian, then you need to put all your actions and words seven days a week in alignment. And don't go on Facebook saying how great God is when you're not living for him. I know God's great, but don't talk about how you're living for him and you're really not. That's a little strong, but let me tell you something. We need revival in America, and that's going to only come through repentance in God changing our hearts amen well i want to pray for you this morning and uh i'm gonna have my church 
Crosswalk. We're going to pray for those that are watching today. I pray that you would share this and continue to uh, put the word out that we preach every week. And we want to thank you for watching today. But right now, let me just pray for you. Father, I pray for all those that are watching. I pray for those that are in the house today, God. I pray that the words that were spoken, the last three things that Jesus spoke, that are recorded that Jesus spoke, it spoke of his, uh, his sacrifice, it spoke of repentance, and it spoke of the Spirit. All those things the church needs today. And God, those that are watching, Lord, if they need to hear this and they need to change their lives, I pray that they could do that. God, that they would begin to allow the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing. We need to allow godly leadership to speak into our lives. I just need to stop and say this. There's somebody out there watching. You're jumping from church to church to church because there's a person in authority that keeps trying to speak life into your life and you're being offended by that. So you jump from church to church to church. But here's the thing. Everywhere you go, God's speaking the same thing through a different mouth, a different mouthpiece. You need to go where God called you. You need to repent and let God use you. Quit being self-righteous and get where God wants you to go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I pray you enjoyed this today. God bless you. I hope you join us next week. We're going to do Pentecost Part 3. we uh, not sure where I'm going with that yet because I can't study you too far out. But until then, God bless you and keep on keeping on for the Lord. Thank you.